Hey there, Euro Bears. All right, strap yourself in. This is a big one. This is a big one. This is the Northern Renaissance. Uh, this is a big event that happens at the same time as the Italian Renaissance. Um, so uh, it's, there's a lot of information here. I'm going to try to be as succinct as I possibly can, uh, while at the same time giving you the good stuff, and uh, hopefully all this stuff will make sense to you. All right, so the Northern Renaissance. When we think of the Renaissance, we think of Italy. We think of what we call the Italian Renaissance. And we think of, well, what does Renaissance mean? It means rebirth. What is being reborn? Classical civilization, the Greeks and the Romans. That's what we think of when we think of the Renaissance. We think of the Italian Renaissance. In the North, they are having their own unique type of Renaissance. Uh, what is being reborn in the North, and by the North I mean the German states, what we call the Holy Roman Empire at the time, uh, the Lowlands, this would be the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg uh, today, which are technically also part of the Holy Roman Empire, and then England. This, this, this is the focus of the Northern Renaissance. So what is being reborn up there? It's not entirely classical civilization. It's not exactly the Greeks and the Romans. Um, they, that stuff is being reborn and is experiencing a resurgence in the North. But more than that, what's being reborn, and this might sound weird at first, is the Bible. Is the Bible. They're starting to read the Bible uh, and, and find out what the Bible really says. So now this may seem strange because like, well, in the Middle Ages, wasn't the Bible always around? Uh, wasn't Christianity always important in the North? Well, yes and no. And this goes back to our friend uh, Charlemagne. So if you remember Charlemagne, who had, you know, created the first Holy Roman Empire and he had conquered, you know, France and the German states and Northern Italy. You know, remember that when Charlemagne would go and conquer uh, pagans like uh, the Saxons, uh, you know, he would massacre them unless they became Christian. And then the deal was these Saxons and other pagans, they said, well, can't we, we'll, we'll accept Christianity, but may we worship Jesus however we want. And, and Charlemagne said yes. And so then you had, you know, this, uh, you know, these ancient Saxon uh, uh, gods and goddesses being incorporated into Christianity. And you have the foundations for things like, you know, how Christians today celebrate Easter or Christmas. All these are pagan. So, and so what happens then for the Northern Renaissance, and I'm going to go back to this slide. What happens then for the Northern Renaissance then is the, the intellectuals there, they want to go to the Bible. They want to learn from the Bible. Well, what is real Christianity? And that's what's going on in the North. There's a return to the Bible. Let's read what Paul actually wrote in the Bible. Let's, let's find out what Jesus actually said. And what they found was that the way Christianity is being practiced by the Catholic Church, which is centered in Italy, in Rome, is very different from what the Bible said. So, the nor so in the North, they start trying to do their own thing. And they start to have this feeling that they are more Christ-like in terms of their, their understanding of the Bible and how they are living than the Italians. And this is, there's a little bit of, even though we don't really use the word nationalism back then, there's a sense of cultural identity and pride that you are more Christ-like um, in this era where everybody's Christian than the head of the church. And this will, of course, pave the way to a Reformation later on. Um, so I've got a couple of slides here uh, about, uh, no about, about the Northern Renaissance. So the humanist in the North, and probably the most important humanist in the North, is Erasmus. But of the intellectual culture that's happening in the North, historians call this Northern humanism or Christian humanism. And both of those are indicative of what they, what, what they mean. It, this type of humanism is happening in the North. It's not happening in Mediterranean Europe. Uh, and it is considered to be more Christian. So hence, Northern humanism or Christian humanism, these two things are the same thing. And then I've got a list of things uh, that are qualities of Northern humanism or Christian humanism. Uh, they consider themselves to be more Christian or less pagan than in Italy. 
and this is reflected in their artwork and in their writings. Uh, there's a focus on Greek and Hebrew texts for better understanding of Christianity, uh, not the Latin text, uh, not the way that the Catholic Church has presented it, but in the original. And um, it, it, the, a lot of the humanists, uh, like Erasmus, are individuals from England, Holland, France a little bit, and uh, the northern German states. Uh, and a lot of them went to Italy to study, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit about at least a few of those guys that went down there. And, um, and, and you know, when they're doing their resurgence, they're really considering their own traditions. Uh, so what happens then is, uh, and this is hopefully a, rep a repetition, you already know this, um, the, in the North there's a sense that they are more Christian. They are more Christian. All right, so I'm going to give you a couple of images here to help you remember the difference between the Northern Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance. Um, so the Italian Renaissance can be considered more playful and pagan. It's more playful and pagan. You know, you look at this Botticelli, it's very happy, it's very bright, uh, You but you've got nothing Christian in it. You've got all these, you know, gods and goddesses coming back uh, from ancient times. Versus if you look at, look at Northern art, Northern art is not pagan and playful, but rather dark and devout, dark and devout. So a lot more Christian images and they are not happy, uplifting, pagan and playful images like you see coming out of uh, Italy. So this particular painting here of Christ bearing the cross is uh, painted by a man named Hieronymus Bosch from the Lowlands. So here is kind of the big thing to know about from the Northern Renaissance. These Northern intellectuals felt that they're more Christ-like than what's happening in Italy. So in other words, if Jesus came back in the year 1500, where would he find his people? Would he find it in Rome with the Pope, with their lavish living, uh, with their kind of wild living? I mean, think of Julius II, the warrior Pope, or Pope Alexander VI and the stuff he was doing. Like, would Jesus feel at home there? Or would he feel at home up north, where there's lands filled with peasants who are living humbly, um, would, would he feel more at home with them? And, and in the North, they're like, this is, we're more Christ-like. Uh, Jesus would feel at home more with the peasants than uh, he would down in Rome. So, so this idea will eventually lead to the Reformation, which we'll learn more about in the next unit. All right, so let's go in depth with uh, some of these guys I need to talk about. Up in England, you have Thomas More. Thomas More is a writer and a gifted intellectual and a devout, devout Catholic. Uh, he was so smart that the King of England, King Henry VIII, uh, who also was uh, really appreciated a strong intellect, he's, he had him become his, his court counselor. So, and Henry VIII became friends with Thomas More. And Thomas More wrote this book called Utopia. And Utopia is an excellent example of Northern humanism because the idea of Utopia is this. Thomas More has read the Bible. He's read the Bible in the original Greek, the New Testament in the original Greek. And he's like, what would the ideal Christian civilization look like? So he designs for his king, Henry VIII, uh, a model Christian community. Uh, he places this model Christian community on an island where they can have, you know, there will be very limited contact with the rest of the world. And he designs this island based both upon Christian, a, a true Christian reading of the Bible and logic. So he combines logic and Christianity and creates this ideal place. His utopia. Utopia is a nice play on words, which is, uh, you know, coming from the Greek. It can mean either utopia, e utopia, um, which like the word euphoria, this could be good place, or utopia can also mean no place. So it's both a good place and it's no place that cannot be found. Uh, so this is Thomas More. Uh, for what it's worth, Thomas More, we'll talk a little bit about him in the future here, because Henry VIII is going to want to get a divorce from his wife and uh, marry a much younger woman, and Thomas More is going to say, no, being a good Christian, you should not do this, and Thomas More, because he stood up to the king for Christian principles, uh, he got his head cut off. He got his head cut off, which is uh, why he's, uh, he's, he's been canonized since by the Catholic Church. Um, he is a saint. He is a saint, Thomas More. All right, 
Thomas More had a buddy down in the Netherlands. Uh, his name was Erasmus. You've read a lot about Erasmus. And Erasmus was a very, very daring writer at the time. He's one of the first guys to really take advantage of the printing press and become a best-selling author. Um, and he wrote a book called uh, In Praise of Folly. And In Praise of Folly is, is a book of humor. It's a book of satire. In, in a very similar way that Boccaccio made fun of uh, the clergy, Erasmus will also make fun of the clergy. But you also remember, hopefully, that Erasmus translated the Bible and gave us, or at least the New Testament, and gave us a much more honest reading of what the Bible said. And so people can now question the practices of the Roman Catholic Church because they can read what the Bible actually said thanks to Erasmus. All right, now we're going to move on. We're going to look at some art. Um, Northern Renaissance art is uh, different from Italian Renaissance art. Again, it is dark and devout, it is dark and devout. Uh, the other thing about Northern Renaissance art is it celebrates everyday life. So, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to see gods and goddesses. We're not going to see Venus being delivered from the ocean foam. There's going to be more of an honest portrayal of how everyday people live. And carried over from the Middle Ages, there's going to be a lot of symbolism buried into the art. Um, now, this can be also said of Italian Renaissance art, too. There's a lot of symbolism in there, too. So, let's talk about a few guys. Jan van Eyck came from uh, the Netherlands. He's Flemish. Um, by Flemish, this would be northern Belgium today. is an area called Flanders. Uh, the language there is a, sort of a dialect of Dutch. Jan van Eyck was one of the first to really use oil paints. And then Dutch developed oil painting and uh, sent oil paints down into Italy. Uh, in Florence, uh, there, were, there were wool traders in Florence and uh, they, had, they traded wool with the Dutch and uh, so they also got paints from the Dutch. So paint came to Italy from the north, uh, which is why a particular art historian at Harvard today said, well, really the Renaissance began in the north, it didn't begin in Italy because the northerners are the ones who developed oil paints first. All right, so Jan van Eyck, there he is. This is a nice self-portrait of him, you know, bright and very, very colorful. Uh, the most famous thing that Jan van Eyck painted for us is a little something called the Arnolfini Wedding. What an incredible painting this is. Um, here you have a young married couple, the woman looking slightly down, her left hand on her pregnant belly, and there is the man blessing the marriage. Uh, some modern feminist interpretations of this, look at this as the man being the head of the household and the woman looking demurely and submissively down. But there's a couple of cool things going on in this painting. Look at the bottom left. <laughs> You've got the classic Dutch wooden shoes. And then look down at the cute little dog. I'll focus on the dog here, right here. There you go. A dog, for any of you who have dogs, you know, dogs are very, very faithful. They're very, very loving. Therefore, they are a symbol of fidelity. So as the man blesses this union, this dog is supposed to, is supposed to uh, symbolize that there's faithfulness between the husband and the wife. And here's the husband and the wife again. Look behind the husband and the wife, and it's one. What you see is uh, one of the most incredible things in uh, Renaissance art in terms of technique. Um, you see that mirror, this concave mirror in between them. Above the concave mirror, Jan Eyck has signed his the painting. Um, so let me focus on this a little bit more. And so on the concave mirror, what Jan van Eyck is doing is showing off just what an incredible painter he is because the mirror reflects what the couple is looking at, or rather what is behind the viewer, you, uh, are looking at, at at the painting. So it almost gives the painting three dimensions. I'm going to focus in on it a little bit more. There's the family of the Arnolfini looking upon the new young couple. Um, there's the light coming in from the window, and there's that. Um, I need to talk about what this mirror might potentially represent. Um, I've seen a mirror like this before, and I saw it in a plantation house in Louisiana when I was doing a tour of, of plantation houses um, in, the, in the Deep South. And, there, and I saw a mirror like this, and I asked the lady who was giving the tour, like, what's that mirror for? Because that mirror is like in an old uh, 15th century Flemish painting. And she said, this is a courting mirror. Um, you would have these concave mirrors for a chaperone if there were two young people who were on a date. 
So you would sit, if you were a chaperone, you would let the two people who were dating come in and they'd sit in a room and you'd want to give them some privacy, but not too much privacy so no shenanigans would happen. And you would sit uh, at the far end of the room where you couldn't hear them talking so they could, you know, have a private conversation, but you want to make sure that there was no fooling around. So you would look at this mirror and because it's concave, it would, you could see the entire room. And so this was a courting mirror which is kind of interesting. So it seems interesting if I go back to the whole painting that this courting mirror would be placed in between the young couple. All right, <laughs> next painter from the North, Peter Bruegel the Elder. There He did have a son, Peter Bruegel the Younger, but uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder is the more famous. He's Flemish as well. He would come from Northern Belgium today. Um, and he, Bruegel, is known for one thing. He paints peasants, the ordinary lives of the peasants. Usually peasant festivities uh, like this one, the peasant wedding. This was painted in the middle of the 16th century, 1568. So actually the Reformation is, uh, is up and running by the time he, he paints this. Um, but what you're looking at here is, you know, one of the joyous occasions of, that, that a peasant would be able to have in their life. Um, if you were a peasant, of course, you didn't have much and you lived on the land that was owned by the, the Lord. So, but when a wedding would happen, a Lord traditionally would pay for a wedding and the number of people that you were allowed to invite to the wedding would be 20. So the, both the, the young husband and young wife would be able to celebrate um, with 20 of their friends and their children would, be able, be, would come and, and the food and the drink would be provided by the Lord who owned the land. And so it was a very, very nice time. It was a time that you could cut loose. And as you look at uh, other Bruegel paintings, what you see is a lot of dancing, a lot of festivities, usually a lot of drinking. Um, and also, if you look closely, not this painting, but other paintings, there's usually uh, men and women getting a little too intimate. Uh, it's, it's a party. Uh, and you can see more Bruegel's paintings in your book, Heretics and Heroes. Um, Bruegel celebrated the lives of ordinary peasants. And and from Bruegel's paintings, we get a, a, an insight into what life was like in Northern Europe. Um, so like this particular painting, which is about hunters coming back after a hunt. And you can see the hunters coming back in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, the dogs, their hunting dogs, are almost as hungry as they are. They're very, very skinny. But you, so there's not a lot of food. But there is a lot of warmth in the painting, even though it's a cold winter day, because there's so people are ice skating. They're having fun out in the ponds. If you look closely in Bruegel's paintings and other paintings, you see Northern Europeans playing hockey, and this is the 16th century. Uh, so you get a sense of what life was really like. It's a it's a celebration of the ordinary. Hieronymus Bosch, Dutch painter, probably one of the most bizarre, enigmatic painters of the entire era anywhere in Europe. I don't know a whole lot about Bosch. I don't know anybody who does. His paintings are absolutely wild, absolutely bizarre. Um, here's a, a, a painting uh, that's one of his more famous ones, but it's not his most famous ones. This is Christ Carrying the Cross, a dark and devout painting if there ever was one. Uh, look at the caricatures of people around Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is in the center of the painting. His face looks serene. He is the son of God getting ready to go to his death, but everybody else around him. Here is the wretchedness of humanity as they kill Jesus. And so with Bosch, you get this. With Bosch, he really wants to show us, here's how ugly you are. Jesus is perfect and that's it. Everybody else is awful and disgusting. Um, and so it really makes you, you know, not like people if you look at Bosch's artwork. Um, this, this piece of artwork is also anti-Semitic, too. If you look in the top middle, you see a man with a hooked nose. This man is supposed to be a Jew who is leading Jesus to his death. Uh, so there is uh, really a ridicule of the Jews in um, in in Bosch's work. Bosch's most famous painting is this one. This is called The Garden of Earthly Delights. Now, as you look at it, it's kind of hard to see at first because there's a lot going on. Uh, but as you can hopefully tell, this was uh, painted in three parts. There's kind of part one, 
on the left, there's the big part, the middle part on, in the center, and then there's a part on the right. This is called a triptych, a triptych. And this is an altar piece. It would go on an altar in a church, which makes this even more bizarre that he would show this in a church once we start getting up close and seeing what's going on in it. But it tells a story, right? It's good for illiterate people. And on the left-hand side, what you're going to see there is the Garden of Eden. So this is humanity as God created humanity and the earth as God created earth. And I know you, it's, it's, it's not too terribly clear, but hopefully you can see uh, two naked figures, a human, two naked people, which are supposed to be Adam and Eve there. This would be in the bottom half of the left-hand uh, column there. Um, and holding the hand of the female is Jesus. So even though Jesus is, of course, not in the book of Genesis, uh, Bosch wants to make sure that we're all Christian, so he puts Jesus there in, in, in the Garden of Eden. And then you go into the centerpiece, the big part, and that is the Garden of Earthly Delights right there. This is supposed to represent after the fall of Adam and Eve, after they get kicked out of Eden, uh, and humanity grows and develops, uh, they turn into this, uh, this wild and crazy party, which is Earth and our earthly life today. And then on the right-hand side is everybody burning in hell <laughs> for the bad things that they did in the Garden of Earthly Delights. So it tells the story. So to repeat, on the left-hand side, there's how God made the Earth, the middle part that's what we're doing to the Earth, and on the right-hand side, there's all of us in hell. So what's being communicated to us here is do not engage in the Garden of Earthly Delights. Be good. Uh, stay away from the sinfulness of your fellow man. But what a weird thing. The majority of this painting is the sinfulness of the, our fellow man. Now, the other thing about the Garden of Earthly Delights as we get close to it is that it's, it's surreal. It's like a dream. It's absolutely bizarre. So I mentioned how in Northern Renaissance art, there is a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism in this painting that we can't even explain. It's surreal. All right, so here's, here's a nice close-up of uh, Jesus holding the hand of Eve, and there's Adam looking on. Everything's pleasant. Everything's wonderful. But even here, things are dreamlike. It's not like Italian Renaissance art where everything's geometrically proportional. There's a weird, bizarre flatness to it, which gives it a dreamlike quality. But now we go to the Garden of Earthly Delights. You know, I don't really have a lot of commentary on this. It's just fun to look at and wonder, what the heck did Bosch mean by all of this? Like, what is going on here? Are these bubbles and we've got a, you know, a, a couple making outs. Uh, there's a man face down in the water, but is... His, his, his legs are up and something's coming out of his crotch. You know, your guess is as good as mine. The Garden of Earthly Delights. More from the Garden of Earthly Delights. <laughs> More from the Garden of Earthly Delights. I do not know what the couple is doing up there in the top left-hand corner. Once again, your guess is as good as mine. But this is supposed to symbolize what we are doing on Earth right now in our sinful, hedonistic, earthly ways. And if we continue, we know what awaits. Hell. So now scenes from Hell from Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. There are a lot of birds in Hell. What's going on here? What are these things supposed to symbolize in hell? I do not know. Your guess is as good as mine. Perhaps the most famous scene out of hell is this, this bird, which is the king of hell. Check this out. Um, let's look at the bird in and of itself. So he's sitting on a throne and he is eating a human being. Now, first of all, that throne is not a throne. That throne is a toilet. And of course, back then, before they had running water, you would, you know, if there was a toilet, it would be in like a castle or something. And the, and, and, you know, what you did into the toilet would drop down into the dungeon. So here he is pooping and he's pooping out maybe some of the people that he's eating. But look at that hole. 
that the that the poop is dropping down into. There's another purse who's another person who's who's you know squatting over the hole, who's looks like he's crapping coins into the hole. There's somebody else who's being forced to vomit into the hole. Um, the crown of this bird is also a chamber pot. So a lot of focus on feces here in hell, as well as his shoes. I'm noticing too. Uh, there's that poor woman uh, sitting at his feet that's being groped in some weird way by this insect-like looking creature with twig arms. Uh, the other thing to look at um, on the top left-hand side uh, is there is a Muslim. Uh, please notice the guy's got this little cap on, a little flag with a crescent half star. Um, and so there's that. Um, and then on top, there is uh, a, 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 some creature ice skating. All right. As we leave Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, these are mostly the German states in Northern Europe. And then also there's the lowlands too. Um, the Holy Roman Empire, the best way to understand it politically is it was a confederacy. Uh, each, there are seven different big regions and each of these regions have princes who are electors. And so how the Holy Roman Empire is, is, is ruled is, is ruled by seven different electors. And the electors elect an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And so beginning in the, in the early 16th century, the early 1500s, the big elector is this guy, Maximilian I, who is a Habsburg. And I've given you the two different spellings you might see of Habsburgs. Um, the one I tend to use is the German word, the original word, which is Habsburg, H-A-B-S-B-U-R-G. Uh, but a lot of people anglicize it to Habsburg. So they're the Habsburg families. So these are going to be the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire. Their rule will continue on through the First World War, through the 20th century. Um, there are still Habsburgs around today, although they are not allowed to live in Austria for reasons we'll get to when we get to the 20th century. Um, but the Habsburgs are the ruling imperial family of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, if you look down at this, uh, in this portrait, this family portrait, you've got Maximilian I there on the left. And the bottom in the center is his son, uh, the future emperor. His name is Charles V. Um, look at Charles V's chin. Uh, he has the classic Habsburg chin, which actually will play a role in history, the size of their chins. It jets out a little bit. They have a huge underbite, the Habsburgs do, uh, which will actually cause them physical and political problems in the future. Here is the family that bankrolls the, the Habsburgs. Uh, the, the, you, can, you can pronounce them Fuggers or Fugers. I've heard it pronounced both ways, Fuggers or Fugers. They are from the beautiful small Bavarian town of Augsburg. These guys are the bankers. These guys are the Medici of Northern Europe. They are the money lenders and they lend money to princes. They also lend money to the emperor. So the Habsburgs are financially beholden to the Fuggers. All right, so just a little review. Remember the Holy Roman Empire, it is a confederacy. There are seven general areas that have princes. And then there are, of course, other you know, smaller princedoms and, and little kingdoms and stuff under, within each of the seven. But there are seven big general areas. Um, they are ruled by an emperor. The emperor of the Habsburgs throughout the entirety of Apira will be the Habsburg family. And at this era in history, the Habsburgs get their money from the Fuggers, who are the, who are the money lenders. They're, think of them as the Medici of the North. All right. And now we get to who I consider to be the greatest of all the Northern European artists. This is a Bavarian man from the town of Nuremberg, Bavaria, a Southern German state. His name is Albrecht Dürer. Albrecht Dürer. If you wanted to anglicize it, Albrecht is the German version of Albert. So Albrecht Dürer, if I can say his name properly. Albrecht Dürer is considered the Leonardo of the North, as in the Leonardo da Vinci of the North, because he is a polymath. He was interested in everything. He was probably a genius. Now, I want to focus on what made him an artistic genius. 
a um, little bit about his story. Um, he, it was clear that he had, he was a gifted artist from a pretty early age and using his artistic ability, he left the German States and he went South to Italy where he met Raphael and hung out with Raphael and hanging out with Raphael while well, Raphael partied and had all his girlfriends and all of this. Albrecht Dürer was astounded with how well he was treated in the, in Italy being an artist meant you had celebrity status. In the north, you were, you were, you were, you were a common craftsman. In the German states, how they thought of artists back then is a little bit how you might think of a craftsman coming into your home to improve upon your home today. So imagine if, for example, your your family wants to get their kitchen redone. You know, they pay these, you know, probably a designer to come in and, and, and other craftsmen come in to build the kitchen. You know, they have a contractor come in and build the kitchen. But that kitchen is yours. That kitchen is yours. It doesn't belong to the craftsman who made it. Albrecht Dürer didn't like the fact that in the German states, painters were common craftsmen. That he wanted to give them the celebrity status that Raphael had. So... What he does is he comes back up north and he comes up north with an idea for how he can break out of the patronage system. He doesn't want a patron. He wants celebrity. He wants to be his own boss and he wants to become a celebrity. So there's something very American about Albrecht Dürer's story. He's a self-made millionaire. He got, it's a rags for riches story and he does it based upon his own talent. So here's how he does it. He starts with woodcuts, with woodcuts. So as you look at this image to the left, he will start with a block of wood and he will chisel into it uh, an image. You take this image then and you uh, on the wood and you cover it with ink and then you press uh, uh, paper onto it so that you can mass produce a piece of artwork. What he has done is he has taken the printing press, which was, of course, invented in Germany, not too far away from where Albrecht Dürer grew up, in the year 1452. Almost a half century later, Albrecht Dürer has learned how you can take the printing press and do exactly what you do with words, but you do it with artwork. So look at this. This is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. This is a scene out of the final book of the Bible, out of the final book of the New Testament is the book of Revelations. And the book of Revelations is probably the most bizarre book in the entire Bible. It's written in this, you know, cryptic language that you have to decipher. And it's about the second coming of Christ. It's when Jesus comes back to save humanity and all the rapturous and horrible things that happen. So it's a bizarre book. It's a bizarre thing to read. And of course, in Northern Europe, they haven't read the book of Revelations because they don't read the Bible. And and, and there are very few people who could do that anyways. So what Dürer is doing is providing the illiterate with this amazing imagery from the Book of, Revel Book of Revelations. The Book of Revelations was translated in the late 15th century into German so that ordinary German people could read this one book out of the Bible, the Book of Jesus' Second Coming, which is a scary, horrific book in the Bible. And Dürer produces the images of it. He essentially provides the illustrations for the book of Revelations. He can mass produce this book. He can mass produce this image so that almost every German will see it. So imagine this in contrast to Botticelli in the 15th century, where you have to actually go to Florence, get into the Medici palace, and then see an image. Durer will become a household name because he mass produces the images and gets them to the people. Aside from that, he wants everybody to know that he painted this image. So look at it again and look at the bottom center part of this image. And you see this AD. That AD, of course, stands for Albrecht Durer. He stamps it so that he's created his own level, label. And people will see that and know that's a Durer painting. He's turned himself into a celebrity. And he does it by the dawn of the 15th century. He sells these books. Uh, he, he sells the images. It's, it, he, he becomes a household name. And he's done it on his own. 
He's not like Botticelli or, or, or Brunelleschi who needed a patron. He did it on his own. Having done it on his own, he is a self-made man. He starts painting himself as he sees himself. So here's his self-portrait in a beautiful fur coat that he may or may not have had. <laughs> and he begins celebrating himself. Nobody will do more self-portraits than Albrecht Durer for a long time. Um, and you see his stamp that he has above, uh, well, being the top left-hand side of, of the painting as we see it. Uh, this particular self-portrait was considered blasphemy because he has painted himself looking like a Byzantine image of Christ, the way he is posed. And Durr's hair and beard kind of looks like Christ anyway. Um, so some people look at this and say, wow, what blasphemy, you've painted yourself like God. Durr's attitude was, no, there's God in each of us. God is in each of us. So I am God and you are God too. <laughs> so this is Durr, highly controversial, genius, self-made man. Now, what I find fascinating is as we go into the early 16th century and Durer gets a little bit older and he's not really that old, what he decides to start painting. He's so rich, he can paint whatever he darn well pleases. All right, so Durer, you can do whatever you want with your life. You're an artistic genius. What do you want to paint? He wants to paint nature. He wants to paint nature. Durer, and here's where I just fall in love with Durer. You know, he can paint anything. So what's he paint? He paints a rabbit. But you got to think like an artist. We see rabbits all the time. They bounce around in our backyard. We don't pay them much attention. Durr did. He looked at these things like, wow, what a fascinating creature. I don't know if any of you are artists, but you can imagine how hard it might be to, to, to capture, based upon your memory, what this thing actually looks like. He starts seeing beauty everywhere. And when I mean everywhere, I mean everywhere. This is one of my most famous pain, favorite paintings of all time ever. Durr finds beauty in a great piece of turf. <laughs> and so we just paint something that anybody could see growing out of their, in, or in their backyard. He starts celebrating nature. And then there's this. Durr did this. He, he, he both drew a rhinoceros, and I'll show you this. He does a woodcut of a rhinoceros. It is important to know as you look at this that Durr never, ever saw a rhinoceros. Uh, there were explorers coming back from Africa and from India who had seen, how do I say it, rhinoceroses, rhinoceri. <laughs> they had seen these creatures and they had described them to Durr. And Durr was so fascinated with him. He's like, I gotta, I gotta try to draw these things. How big are they? What do they look like? So what you're looking at here is the equivalent today of a police sketch artist version of an animal. He never saw it. And look at how amazingly accurate it is. All right. There's a few religious paintings here that I am gonna skip over. He was so well known that the Habsburg emperor said, do my painting, do my portrait, paint my portrait. And so Durr famously will get even more money because he does get patronized. He doesn't need their money, but he does it anyways because he's the greatest painter in Northern Europe. Another religious painting I'm not going to talk about. And then uh, this. Um, I like to say that two animals killed Albrecht Durr. Um, the, uh, a, a whale and a mosquito. Those are the two animals that killed Albrecht Durer. Uh, as you look up there in the top left, Durer was in the lowlands painting the, uh, portrait of the young, uh, Habsburg Emperor Charles V, who we'll talk a lot about during the Reformation. And while he was up there, he heard that off the coast of Denmark, there was a beached whale. Now, Durr had never seen a whale before. He's obsessed with, you know, animals, like especially exotic animals. He's like, I gotta see it. So he gets in a carriage uh, to go, you know, to travel several weeks to the coast of, of, of Denmark to see this beached whale. And while he was traveling, uh, he, he contracted malaria, which we know is spread by mosquitoes. And this is what killed him. He died of a, of a fever from malaria. And so that then was the end of Durr. 
And guys, I'm happy to say this is the end of my very, very long presentation on, uh, North, on the Northern Renaissance. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned from it. If you have any questions, uh, hey, ask me in class. Uh, come on in office hours. Love to talk to you about it. All right, guys. Have a great day.